Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 11 out of the textbook of Sengel and Gijar. Ach, not chapter 10, chapter 11. Chapter 11 is on heat exchanges. We've already completed the first part, which were on the types of heat exchanges, the overall heat transfer coefficient, the analysis of heat exchanges, and then there are two very important sections in this part of the textbook. The one is the LMTD method, and the other one is the overall uh, the effectiveness NTU method. Now, with the previous lecture, we've started with the LMTD method. We've done the method, and we've done one example, but that is not enough. There's one more example that I would like to do with you before we're going to proceed with the second method, which is the effectiveness NTU method. And the problem example that I want to do is example 11.3. It is a steam condenser. So it says steam is con in the condenser of a power plant is to be condensed at a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius with cooling water from a nearby lake which enters the tube of the condenser at 14 degrees Celsius and leaves at 22 degrees Celsius. The surface area of the tubes is 45 square meters and the overall heat transfer coefficient is 2100 watts per square meter degree Kelvin. Determine the mass flow rate of the cooling water needed and the rate of condensation of the steam in the condenser. Okay, so here's the condenser, steam condensing at 30 degrees Celsius and then we've got cooling water from a nearby lake which, which circulates and condenses the steam and the water enters at 14 degrees Celsius and its exit temperature is 22 degrees Celsius. What is also given is the surface area of the heat transfer of the tubes which is equal to 45 square meters and the overall heat transfer coefficient is 2100 watts per square meter Kelvin. <coughs> And they ask us to determine the mass flow rate of the steam, which is the hot side, and also the mass flow rate of the cooling water. So the mass flow rate of the two streams. Okay. Now, when you're going to get a problem like this in industry or in the exam, you're going to look at this and you're going to see, well, I've got two temperatures, but I don't have the mass flow rate. So I cannot determine the heat transfer rate. Okay. And then you're going to look at this side and you're going to see, well, 30 degrees Celsius inlet, and, now I, and I don't have an outlet temperature. Okay. But that is where you make the mistake. Okay. Because, remember, what happens during condensation, if you look on a TS diagram, on the TS diagram, condensation, the steam changes from a gas to a liquid. And it happens at a constant temperature. Okay. So if it has been given to you that you've got a boiler or evaporate, evaporator, a condenser or anything like that, and one temperature is given, then you've got both temperatures. And it's not all you also, from the steam tables, can get the change in enthalpy. Okay. Okay, so if we now look at the two streams, now that we know what happens with the steam, and we show it on a TX diagram, although the X might not be there, okay, because we are going to force this heat exchanger to be a sort of a counterflow heat exchanger. Okay, so the steam temperature remains constant. The inlet temperature is 30 and the outlet temperature is also 30. And that is TH, that is the hot side. And let's show the direction in that direction because we can and we just choose it like that. Okay, now 
to condense that steam, we've got cool water from a lake which enters this condenser. So it enters at 14 degrees Celsius and it exits at 22 degrees Celsius. Okay. And that is the cooling side. Okay, so the heat transfer rate is obviously going to be from the steam to the water. Okay, that is going to be the direction of heat transfer. And on this side, we actually have, let's call it delta T1, which is this temperature change, which is 8 degrees Celsius. And on this side, we have delta T2, which is equal to 16 degrees Celsius. So, we can actually calculate the LMTD. So, the LMTD temperature difference, and we've derived it, how it is being done, is always this temperature difference, which is 8. Okay, 30 minus 22 is 8 degrees Celsius, minus this temperature difference, 30 minus 14, which is 16 divided by the lin of 8 divided by 16 and that gives an effective temperature difference of 11.5 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now we can calculate the heat transfer rate is equal to UA multiplied by F LMTD overall heat transfer coefficient is given as 2100. The surface area is given as 45 square meters. Okay. F is equal to 1, the correction factor. Why? Because we've got condensation. Okay. If we've got a heat exchanger which is not a parallel flow or a counter flow, we have to use the tables in terms of the F values and the, of the R values and the P values to determine the correction factor. Okay. Now in that, we've got an R or a P and the delta T is going to be zero or infinite in one of those two terms. So we've said in general, the moment we've got boiling or condensation on one of the streams, then F is equal to 1. Okay. Multiplied by the LMTD, which is equal to 11.5, and that gives us a heat transfer rate of 1087 kilowatts. Okay, 1087 kilowatts. Right. Now that, now that we know the heat transfer rate, we can calculate the mass flow rates of both streams. Okay, let's look at the hot stream. For the hot stream, the heat transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp multiplied by Th in minus Th out. Okay, you happy with that? Samantha, what's wrong? Yes, because it is in a two-phase flow region, region, the CP doesn't exist. So we cannot use that. That is for a single phase fluid. It is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by HFG. Okay, the heat transfer rate we have determined as 1087 kilowatts is equal to the mass flow rate and the hot side multiplied by HFG and HFG we can get from the steam tables or from your textbook 
from table A9. From a table A9. And from this, we can now calculate the mass flow rate on the hot side, which is equal to 0.45 kilograms per second. Okay, now on the cooling side, it is a single phase fluid, it is water, and now we can say it is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp multiplied by Tc out minus Tc in. The heat transfer rate is equal to 1087 kilowatts. It's equal to the mass flow rate on the cold side multiplied by Cp of water typically between temperatures of 22 and 14 it would be 4184 multiplied by the outlet temperature which is 22 minus the inlet temperature which is 14 so it is very simple to calculate the mass flow rate of the water as 32.5 kilograms per second. Okay, any questions? Nothing? Okay, what this problem also shows us is how much energy is into steam. Okay, just look at this problem. The temperatures of 30 and 14 and 22 both water, okay. in the one case it is steam, okay. to do the heat transfer rate of the steam we only need about 0.45 kilograms per second but on the water side 32.5 kilograms per second for the same heat transfer rate. You see? Okay. Right, now the next part in the textbook is the effectiveness into you method, paragraph 11.5 in the textbook of Sengel and Gajar. Okay. okay, now this method is specifically very handy to use if the outlet temperatures are not given. Suppose that temperature was not given to us. Okay. Then it wouldn't be possible for us to calculate the LMTD. Okay. Then you can't calculate the problem. It doesn't mean it cannot be solved. It is just very difficult to solve. You have to iterate it quite a lot okay. to solve the problem. And that is where this problem, the effectiveness NTU problem, is very handy. Okay. Now the effectiveness NTU method starts by defining the effectiveness epsilon. And it says the effectiveness is equal to the actual heat transfer rate divided by the maximum possible heat transfer rate. The actual heat transfer rate divided by the maximum possible heat transfer rate. Okay, where the actual, where the actual heat transfer rate can be written as QH is equal to the mass flow rate on the hot side multiplied by Cp on the hot side multiplied by TH in minus TH out or we can write these two terms as the heat capacity ratio as we've done in the previous lecture CH CH multiplied by TH in minus TH out. Okay. And we can do it the same on the cold side. We can say the heat transfer rate on the cold side is equal to the mass flow rate on the cold side multiplied by CP on the cold side multiplied by TC out minus TC in 
is equal to the heat capacity rate on the cold side multiplied by Tc out minus Tc in. Okay, so that is in terms of the actual heat transfer rate. Let's look at the maximum possible heat transfer rate. Okay, the maximum possible heat transfer rate. Let's do it in terms of a few graphs. Okay, we know that typically in a counterflow heat, heat, heat exchanger, that is what is going to happen, isn't it? two streams, the hot stream and the cold stream. Okay, now, suppose I would increase the heat, the heat transfer surface of the heat exchanger. I would make it more and more and more and more. What is going to happen then? What is going to happen? Okay. This is Tc in and that is equal to Th in. Oh. No, Th out. Okay. Tc in and Th out. Yeah, sorry, I've made a mistake here. Let's just change these directions. Okay, so that is TH in. Okay, do you agree? Okay. That's the inner temperature on the hot side, and that is the inner temperature on the cold side. If I would increase the surface area, what would happen? If I would make the surface area infinite. This temperature, this outlet temperature, would at the end try to get to this temperature, do you agree? Okay. And or this temperature should get to that temperature, isn't it? Okay. Now it depends on CH. Remember CH is the heat capacity ratio and it gives us an indication of how much heat is necessary to change the temperature with one degree Celsius. Okay. So if this value is very low, if it's very low, then it means that I do not need a lot of energy to increase the delta T. Okay. If it is large, I obviously need a lot of energy to increase the temperature with one degree Celsius. So let's look at the first case where these two values are the same. If these two values are the same, then this heat exchanger is going to do the following. Okay. CH is equal to CC. Okay. Do you agree? Okay. Then the next case would be <coughs> if the two C's are not equal to each other. Okay, if the two C's are not equal to each other. Okay, if the two C's are not equal to each other. And that is going to happen. Okay. okay. So if this one is the smallest one, if 
that one is the smallest one, then that one is going to achieve the maximum delta T. Can you see that? Because it needs the less energy for the highest temperature increase, the highest temperature change. <laughs> okay. And then the last one is going to be that one, like that, if this one is the minimum, if this one has the smallest heat capacity, it means it needs less energy for higher delta T. Okay, so those are the different scenarios that we can get. So at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it is about this temperature difference which is known as delta T max. The maximum possible temperature difference that you can get in the heat exchanger is equal to TH in minus TC in. The two temperature in the temperatures. That is the maximum possible delta T that we can get. Okay. So therefore, okay, after this argument, you will see that Q max, the maximum possible heat transfer rate that you can get out of a heat exchanger is equal to C minimum multiplied by TH in minus TC in. Or C minimum multiplied by delta T max. You follow? Okay. Okay. Now, with that as background, we can go and look at the parallel heat exchanger again. With the parallel heat exchanger, We've looked at the control volume. We've looked at the control volume, and we've looked at all the heat transfer going in and out on the delta T's. And the result of that was an equation, which was equation 11.23, and that equation looks like this: the lin of TH out minus TC out divided by TH in minus TC in is equal to minus UA multiplied by 1 divided by the mass flow rate of the hot side, CP on the hot side, plus 1 divided by the mass flow rate on the cold side and CP on the cold side. Okay. Now using that equation and also doing some mathematical derivations, and we're not going to go through all the detail, it is in your textbook, we can actually now go and calculate the, eff the effectiveness of a parallel flow heat exchanger. Okay, I use PF to indicate it is parallel flow heat exchanger. Okay, now the effectiveness is then equal going to be 1 minus E to the minus U multiplied by the area divided by C minimum multiplied by 1 plus C minimum divided by C maximum divided by 1 plus C minimum divided by C maximum. Now this same derivation can be done for a counterflow heat exchanger, a crossflow heat exchanger, etc. Okay. We are not going to do the derivation, but the same can be done for them. And once you've done all these equations, you will see that there are a few terms that appears all the time. Okay. There are a few terms that appears all the time. The one is one that we've already seen before. The number of transfer units. The number of transfer units is equal to U multiplied by the surface area divided by C minimum. 
Okay, there it is. The number of transfer units. And it gives us in, in, an indication of the size of, the, of a heat exchanger. Okay. Then, something else which also appears a lot, which is, is called the capacity ratio. And the capacity ratio is equal to C minimum divided by C maximum. And there again, you will see it in the equation. Okay. So in general, ladies and gentlemen, the effectiveness, if we look at it, we can see it is a function of two things. The number of transfer units and the capacity ratio. And this is not only the case for the parallel flow heat exchanger, it is the same for the counter flow and every type of heat exchanger. So all the heat exchangers can be written as one or other equation with effectiveness is a function of the number of transfer units and the capacity ratio. Now in your textbook, there are a few very important Equations. And they are in table 11.4, in figure 11.2b, and table 11.5. Okay, let's look at table 11.4. Lloyd, if you can go up there. Okay, table 11.4. Take a look at it quickly. How many types of heat exchanges do you see there? Okay, in general, four categories. Okay, the first category is the parallel flow one. It is that equation there, which has now been written as a function of NTUs and Cs. Then you see the counter flow one. The shell and chew pass for different two passes, a one shell pass, two passes, then a cross flow one, depending if the C is mixed or unmixed and stuff like that, and then the all heat exchanges with that last equation there. Okay. So if you would now look at those equations and you would like to do a selection in terms of your heat exchanger, which one will you choose? Just looking at that table. Obviously, you can go and plot those effectivenesses. Okay. There's one of them which is the magic heat exchanger, the great one. Which one is that? I've heard somebody say number four. Why? Hmm? For all of them. For, oh, for all of them. <laughs> Okay. okay. The one which is the most important there is number four. Okay, number four is the case where C is equal to zero. All heat exchanges with C equals zero. All with C equals zero. When will C equal, be equal to zero if we look at this capacity ratio? C is equal to C minimum divided by C maximum. When will that be equal to zero? When this term goes to infinite. When does that happen? When does that happen? During? For condensers and for boilers. So the moment we've got two phase flow on any one of the sides, then you forget all the equations, then you go to this one. So does it matter if it's a single phase, a parallel flow, or whatever? The moment we've got condensation or evaporation, boiling, then C is equal to zero. Why? Because that term is infinite. CP value doesn't exist, as, Aman as Samantha indicated. Okay. So that is the most important of all of them. Okay. Now, those equations can also be written in different formats. 
formats. For example, we might be interested to know the NTUs as a function of effectiveness. Okay, and let's see if I can show you table 11.5. Table 11.5. There it is. So now it gives us the NTUs as a function of effectiveness. Okay. And then figure 11, let me see if I can show you that one. Okay, this should not be 11.2, it should be 11.26. Figure 1126 is a very important graph. I know it is a little bit small there, but please take a look at it. Okay, figure 11.26. And let me see if I can zoom in on it a little bit so that at least we can see what is going on in one of the graphs. Okay. Yeah, okay. Let's look at those two. Okay, the first graph is the effectiveness. <coughs> okay. Is the effectiveness as a function of the NTUs for a one shell heat exchanger with two two passes. Do you see that? And then this one also the effectiveness with two shells now, but in general there we can see the effectiveness as a function of the NTUs for different ratios of C minimum divided by C maximum. Okay. Okay, now this morning I actually received an email from a student in India asking a question on this, and that I will address on the lecture on Monday. Okay. But let's look at what is happening here. We've seen that previously, if the NTUs starts becoming more than three, okay, then the lines are very, very flat. You see that? Okay, if you get to five, really the lines are so flat. I mean, between three and five means that actually you're going to double almost the heat transfer area. But the, heat the effectiveness of the heat exchanger is going to improve by something like 5%. So it's not really very cost effective to design a heat exchanger with an NTU value larger than 3. You see that? Okay. Then the other thing that I hope you see is the ratios of the C minimum divided by C maximum. Okay, which line is always the highest? Which one is the highest? The one that we've discussed there where C is equal to 0. If C is equal to zero, it means that C maximum must be very large, and that would be the cases where we have condensation or evaporation. Okay. So in general, we can see that if you design a heat, heat exchanger, if you design it with an NTUs of three, and you've got condensation or evaporation on one of the sides, then the effectiveness of the heat exchanger is going to be about 95%. You see that? Okay. While if the ratio is equal to 1, then the effectiveness is going to be less than 60%. You see that? Okay. When will that ratio be equal to 1? C minimum divided by C maximum would be equal to 1. C minimum divided by C maximum would be equal to 1 when the mass flow rate on the cold side multiplied by the CP on the cold side is equal to the mass flow rate on the hot side multiplied by CP on the hot side. Okay. So if, for example, we've got water on both sides, then the two CPs would be the same. If the mass flow rates are also the same, then that ratio would be equal to 1. And then our heat exchanger would be very ineffective. We will see that in all the cases. Okay. If we look also now at this heat exchanger, where we've got two shells, 
And again, we look at the NTUs of 3. Okay. We look at the NTUs of 3. And we've got condensation or evaporation. Uh, then our effectiveness of our heat exchanger is going to be about 95%. You see that? Mm -hmm. okay. And if we would, for example, use water on both sides with a mass flow rate the same, and we compare the effectiveness of this heat exchanger, then we will see there it is about 70%, while on that side it is going to be le less than 60%. So that is one of the advantages of bringing the fluid back, going through the shell a second time. You see that? Okay. Now in terms of the theory that we've done, we've said that in general the heat transfer rate is equal to U multiplied by A, multiplied by the correction factor, multiplied by LMTD. Okay. Okay. The moment we have condensation or evaporation, then again we've said that that F would be equal to 1, the correction factor. And this would be the LMTD of a counterflow heat exchanger, the configuration as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. Okay. I wanted to do example 11.8, but we are running out of time. So, are there any more questions? If not, then we will continue with that example on Monday. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.